<laughs> the Apple Heart Study is one of the biggest medical trials in history, 420,000 participants. And this week it achieved the medical equivalent of going number one on the trending tab. Yes, it was published in the most prestigious medical periodical, the New England Journal of Medicine. But what did it show and what does it all mean? The structure of this video will be summarizing the trial, explaining why I think it changes everything, and lastly, but most importantly, a few words of warning about what this may mean for you. It's been about a year since my Apple Watch ECG video when I managed to trigger a lot of angry Apple fans by calling it an iWatch, even though that's what Tim Cook says. As of today, the iWatch. So who's the real fan? And in that video, I talked about the perils of overdiagnosis, specifically the overdiagnosis of something called atrial fibrillation or AF, an irregular heartbeat that can increase your chance of having a stroke. And that's what the Apple Watch has been designed to look for. So is that what's happened, this overdiagnosis? Well, judging by the newspaper headlines, no, it has been universally reported as being reliable at detecting AF. Several have mentioned the high positive predictive value, meaning that an abnormal reading detected by the watch had a high chance of corresponding to a true diagnosis of AF. Well, that sounds great. Okay, but this is if it ducks like a quack. And if you've watched by now, you will know that my message is to always look past the headlines. The first important thing to say is that this study is not about the ECG feature that my video last year was about. This is about the automatic detection by the optical photoplethysmography sensor, the little flashing lights on the back that are on all the time. Here is the one paragraph summary. 420,000 people voluntarily enrolled in the Apple Heart Study over eight months. Now, as somebody who took a year to recruit about 30 people to a study, let me tell you, this is uncharted territory for medicine. It's something we've never seen before, and that's very exciting. You obviously needed to own an Apple Watch and a connected Apple device. Now, Apple users are more affluent than most, so this is a selection bias. But of course, Apple can't do anything about that, so it's not a criticism of the trial, just something to bear in mind. Most people were under 40 years old. Atrial fibrillation is uncommon in that age group. AF carries greatest risk for over 65s, who only comprised 6% of recruits into the trial. Out of all those 420,000 people, 0.5% or just over 2,000 got an abnormal heart rhythm alert. Those people were then sent a special ECG patch to wear for up to seven days, which is a uh, well-used and validated way to diagnose AF. Out of those 2,000 people, 21% returned the patch. And out of that 21%, a third actually turned out to have atrial fibrillation. So, enrollment of almost half a million people resulted in 153 cases of AF. But let's drill down a little bit further. Out of the people under 40, i.e. the majority of the people in the trial and the majority of people watching this on YouTube, only 0.16% had an abnormal reading and most of them did not turn out to have AF on formal testing. There's a, there's a really loud vacuum cleaner, a lot of drilling and what sounds like a Lithuanian dance party going on outside. So apologies for the noise. And for the small handful of participants, I'm reluctant to call them patients because that implies they're unwell in some way, under the age of 40 who genuinely had AF, we don't actually know what to do with this information. This is a more complex topic, but essentially we don't know much about AF in young people, but more on that a bit later. 450 people returned the patch, and out of that 450, a subgroup of 86 who had irregular pulse notifications during the period when they were wearing the patch, 72 of them had AF, giving the very impressive 84% positive predictive value. So the opening line of 420,000 patients is kind of irrelevant if you're then going to claim a positive predictive value based on 86 people. A lot less dramatic when you really look at the figures, isn't it? But hey, if they hadn't mentioned that dizzying 420,000 figure, then it wouldn't have been front page news around the world. One thing I talked about in my previous Apple Watch video was that we might need to reassess what AF means if we're detecting it in young, fit people. This is definitely an exciting opportunity to learn more about the disease process in a demographic that we haven't studied before. But let's be honest, the reason we've not studied it in young people is because young people simply don't suffer from problems related to AF very often. 
So I think we'd have to admit that the reason we're doing it is academic interest rather than for the purpose of saving lives. So the results of this study aren't really that important, but the study itself is. It ushers in a new era of medical research. Whether it will give us clinically useful information remains to be seen. I hope it will. I've already tried to convey how bewildering the numbers are. Apple aren't even stopping there. You can now download the Apple Research app and take part in other studies. Studies announced include the Apple Hearing Study, where your watch will listen for noise levels, the Apple Heart and Movement Study with Brigham and Women's, and the Apple Women's Health Study with Harvard that will track the menstrual cycles and reproductive health of a million women which all sound brilliant, on paper at least, or perhaps that should be on screen. Along with the Apple Heart study, this is just the first four. Expect this number to skyrocket. The tech giants are all muscling into health as the next frontier. Google, Amazon, Microsoft are all working on AI and machine learning, but Apple is going in a slightly different route and actually going out and gathering new data. We've talked about novelty bias on this channel before, the belief that anything new is better. It's totally natural to be excited by this. I am. Nobody would blame someone for saying that this could give us untold new information, but the bottom line is, we don't know that yet, and medicine is littered with failed technologies and therapies that we initially thought were game changers. The abstract concludes by saying, this sightless pragmatic study design provides a foundation for large-scale pragmatic studies in which outcomes or adherence can be reliably assessed with user-owned devices. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing where this goes. I think it could be amazing as long as we don't get carried away. Like many researchers, my mind is already bubbling over with ideas for projects. I wonder how that would actually work. Would you need to get your research project listed in the App Store? Hey guys, if you enjoyed your colonoscopy, please remember to give us five stars on iTunes. It really helps. We rightly get suspicious when pharmaceutical research is funded by pharmaceutical companies. People say, follow the money. Trials promoting Adderall are funded by Shire. Trials promoting milk are funded by the dairy industry. Trials promoting cereal are funded by farming associations, and so on and so on. The thing being tested is on sale, and the money for the research is coming from the people that are selling it. Now, Right on the front page of this study, it says in clear black and white letters, funded by Apple. And the trial is about an Apple product. But I'm not seeing the same level of complaints about bias or conflicts of interest. So why do we think that the biggest company in the world is any more benevolent in their motives than any others? For the record, I love my Apple products and I don't have anything against them, except maybe the price of the new MacBook Pro, but um, hey. I wasn't using that kidney anyway. If Apple was serious about finding useful information about AF, it would study older patients. But it wants to sell its product to everybody, so it's not going to do that. Let's be consistent. Industry funding introduces bias. It doesn't matter what that industry is. We can't give Apple a free pass just because their products are more desirable than pacemakers or statins. The New England Journal itself runs an editorial alongside the paper raising concerns about privacy. It worries that we're voluntarily giving away more and more data about ourselves and says, the uncomfortable fact is that our personal health data have considerable financial value to those who want to use them in the myriad marketplaces connected to our $3.7 trillion health economy. But having said that, I don't have major concerns about this particular study. It seems like the designers and the researchers took privacy seriously. At least that's my read. Perhaps I'm being too trusting. Certainly, we don't know if that will always be the case in future. So, in summary, I don't think the results of this trial are particularly interesting, but I think the structure and the method of the research is something new, exciting, and possibly a little bit scary. I think that we need to avoid over-medicalizing our lives and voluntarily turning everybody into a patient. And most importantly, I think that we as human beings need to remain in charge and in possession of our own health data. Some of you will have noticed that I've changed setting. Uh, the studio is still very much a work in progress, so I'll give you a proper update when it's all done. I want. 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 I want.